First Peter 3.15. You know, um, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the, the, this uh, message is that I'm entitling Hope for the Hopeless. We're talking about hope. And you know, uh, a lot of times we wonder, I know we think, well, where, where, where's the hope? Where, where is my hope? How, how, do, I, how do I find hope? A- and we, we're talking about hope. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Peter begins to speak, and he says, Sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that is, is in you, with you, with meekness and fear. Sanctify the Lord in your heart and be ready to give an answer. Why do you have hope? You know, I thought about that a lot. You know, we, we think that and we think, well, you know, be ready to preach or be ready to whatever. A- and I, I wonder sometimes, what would our answer be? What would our answer be if somebody come by and said, why do you have hope? You know, I, I've, uh, it's interesting. I, it's it's kind of like, uh, I remember I was going through some training and, and the pastor asked us, said, okay, said we were in this he said i want you to get up here and i want you to share your faith share jesus and and it was kind of an impromptu thing matter of fact that would be fun let's do that no <laughs> kidding but <laughs> and he said get up here and share your faith Are you ready share your testify share your faith and i remember i got up the first time and i was thinking man jesus is so great and jesus is awesome man jesus is just great and i just love him and he's just so great and he said that was really good but you didn't tell us anything <laughs> Uh, he was mean like that. He didn't tell us anything. And I, and I wonder sometimes what our responses were. What our responses were. I, I think in 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, he, he talking, he says, and he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he said, the Lord Jesus Christ who is our hope. And I think that's the answer we would give sometimes. Well, Jesus is our hope. And that would be as far as we'd want to go with that. Come on. We'd say, well, I have a hope. So if you were to try to share with somebody who was hopeless and, or didn't feel like they had hope, you might give an answer similar to that. Well, Jesus is hope. And to the world or to somebody who doesn't know some of the things you know or some of the things maybe you've experienced, they would, that really wouldn't mean much to them. Come on. So, well, Jesus is our hope. And they would, they would go, okay, weirdo. Now, we don't think that. I, I, I say the name of Jesus, and it means a great deal to me. But to the world, it really doesn't. And they don't really know anything about that. So why is it that Jesus is our hope? So I, 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 the Bible teaches us to be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in me. Turn me to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. I've got to tilt my glasses down. I gotta get new glasses too, cause some guys making fun of me cause my glasses are crooked. Are my glasses still crooked? Yeah. Cool. I need to get new glasses. Hebrews chapter seven. Sorry, ADHD kicked in. Hebrews chapter seven, <laughs> verse seventeen. Hebrews seven, seventeen. Talking about hope, says for he testifies that you, speaking of Jesus, are ever or excuse me forever after the order you're a priest forever after the order of melchizedek for there is verily a disannulling disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness and the unprofitableness thereof for the law made nothing perfect but the bringing in of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto god and inasmuch as it is not written an oath he was made priest so here's this, this, uh, uh, this, this message, and there is a New Testament, verse 22, it says, By so much more was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Why is Jesus my hope? He says, first of all, he was made a priest in a different order, in a different manner. You see, the thing is that the old law, the old uh, testament, and the things of the old testament were basically a set of rules to tell you when you had broken the law. You know, I, 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 was, I was watching this uh, uh, show the other night. It says, Almost Got Away With It. You ever see that? No? Okay. Well, is it Almost Got Away? It's about crooks who tried to get away with it. And then there's always this point in the show, because it's almost got away with it. There's always this point in the show when they get caught, right? And they're finally 
caught. And that's it, and they know they're caught. And you can see it, there's like this, I am guilty, and now I'm caught. And you can see this give up point. <sighs> Fine, I'm done. You always see that. In the law, and, and, and what we find is that in the law, or in the world today, every one of us comes to that point where we come to a recognition that we are guilty. Everybody. We all come to a place in our life at some point. We like to hide it. Maybe we push it away. Maybe we act like, oh, no, that didn't ever happen to me. But no matter how much you act or no matter how much you pretend, there comes a place in our lives where we come to a place in our life where we begin to realize, well, we're not as good as we. Maybe, maybe it, it's in your job or, and you deci- discover, you know, I'm not as good as I thought I was. Or, or in sports where many of our, our kids come up through sports thinking, I'm the best football player in the world. And, and as parents, we're like, you're the best. You're the best. You know, and they get in the real world and they find out they really stink. You know, but they didn't know that because you didn't tell them that. And they come to this realization that I'm not as good as I thought I was. We all come to a place in our life where we discover that we fall short of sometimes of what we think we should be or where we think we should go. Or we find ourselves guilty. And the law was just this big rule book that's set up there just to tell us how much we fell short and the idea is that we find this 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 plan or this thing in our life well uh for for some of us you know what we've been trying for so many years or well man it's just too late i've been trying so long or i've messed up so many times i've done this you know i've made these mistakes and i'll never get to this point because of all these things in our life this idea that Jesus come over a, a whole different covenant, over a whole different priesthood, the idea was that Jesus came to bring this new covenant by which your guilt, your inabilities, your failures, all of the things in your life that you were no longer, that, that you knew that's it, I'm guilty, there's no hope because I truly am guilty. This is truly as good as I'll ever be or whatever. You know, I'm trying to be as broad with it because it it affects us in different ways at different times in our life. And sometimes in your life, you find yourself, you've done something and you really feel bad about it and you realize it's already done. You ever said something and go, shoot, there it was. I have, sorry, babe. (laughs) You know, you say something and you realize, oops, I should never have said that. I wish I couldn't say that, but I said it and now it's out. And where's the hope? (sighs) The hope dwindles. I wish I never would have been there, but I was. I wish I would have done this differently, but I didn't. And the hope begins to fade. Under the covenant of Christ, what makes Christ's covenant a covenant of hope is that it is a covenant that takes those things that we are not. The Bible says that where we are weak, he becomes strong. It takes those sins. It takes those inabilities. It takes the things you cannot do. The Bible says, you can't do anything without me, but I'll do it in you. It takes all of that stuff, all of the things that lead to hopelessness, and it replaces them with Christ who becomes our hope. Where I was guilty and I stand guilty, I'll never forget, I I was driving this car and it it wasn't the best of cars and I know I keep going to these stories but it's a good story and I remember I had trouble getting it in gear sometimes it wouldn't really go into gear and I don't know if the clutch was going bad or the transmission was going I don't know what it was but it would I'd have trouble getting it going into gear and I remember I'm standing at this light and the light turns green and the cars move and I don't move because I'm struggling with this car and then I'm fighting with it and I finally get it in gear and pop the clutch and head out and the light goes ding red well, I'm in it now. <laughs> and then it went red and blue. Really weird how that happened. And so, you know, he pulls me over and he gives me this ticket. And I'm thinking, come on, that way, I mean, it turned green. I'm like the second car. You should be able to make it if you're the second car. You know, and I'm feeling like that's it, man. I, I'm, I'm fighting this thing, and I'm, I'm gonna. I didn't read that red light, you know. And I go to court, and I'm sitting in court, and I'm thinking, man, I'm gonna somehow, you know. If it, and the judge gets up, and he starts going through these. And you know, it's weird. There's a lot of other people that run the red light. And the judge was up there and guilty, and this guy was saying, but judge, you know, I was trying to avoid an accident, and this car came in, and, and I tried to avoid the accident, and I got 
you know, it, I mean, there was a car coming into my lane. I mean, it was go through or, or get hit, and, and it was just yellow. And the judge says, if the light turns yellow, you're guilty. Boom, guilty. And I'm going, I'm going down. You know, I remember in court, the next guy got up, and he got in trouble because he got pulled over. And he didn't have his driver's license, and as it turns out, he had, he had used his ID in the store and then was on his way home. And he's like, your honor, I got it. I got everything. I have insurance. I have everything. I just took my driver's license out at the store and left it on the counter. Here it is. Here's the proof, the letter from the store. Here's everything. And the judge says, the law says you must have your driver's license on you at all times. Boom, guilty. And I'm thinking, I am so busted. And I remember sitting there completely. But when I went in there, I had hope. I'm going to smooth my way right through this thing. Right? And I remember I got before the judge, and I'm giving my thing. This is what happened, and this is what happened. And he turned to me, and he said, okay, did you see that light turn red before you went through it? And all the argument in my face left. Because I knew at that moment I was guilty. And I went, yeah, I did. He said, well, you're guilty. He said, here's the thing. Those lights are time. He began to go through this field. You know, those lights are time for a semi-truck to have time to go through there and to stop. And if you saw it turn red, there's no, you had plenty of time to stop before those. And, and technically, the law says stop at yellow. It doesn't mean you can go, keep going. You're supposed to stop. If you can stop, you're supposed to stop, even if you have to squish your, squill your wheels. And he goes through this thing. He says, but, he says, I'm in a better mood than I was a few minutes ago, and I'm going to let you off. True story. You know what I think happened? I think that I fessed up and he knew it. Because my whole countenance, I was guilty. And I knew I was guilty. And when he asked me, did you see it turn red? I told him straight up, yeah, <laughs> I sure did. I couldn't lie to him. I saw it turn red as I was driving through it. And he said, free, not guilty. Listen, this is what Jesus does for me. Why do I have hope? I have hope because all of my failures, all of my, even when I'm at fault, come on. Even when it is truly my fault, I run to Jesus. And Jesus looks at me and he goes, you are guilty. Sure as you live. You did it. It's your fault and you're guilty. And it just so happens that I'm the one that can say it, and so you're free. You're no longer guilty, and you can go free. That's why Jesus is our hope. Jesus is my hope because of the failures of my past do not have to go into my future. Jesus is my hope because I can, whatever things has happened, whatever problems, whatever situations, whatever things that are back there that are right now telling you there's no hope, I mean, you know, if we fail and fail and fail and fail, pretty quick that failure comes on to us, and we, it's hard to even try again. Come on. You should amen me. I like it when you do that. Thank you. We get to a point where we don't even want to try anymore. We get to a point where we just don't even, we don't even, we don't have the umption to, to try anymore or to go forward. We, our help begins to fade because of what's happening in our past. Because we begin to look at the worldly view or, or the, we begin to look at the way it seems or appears. And we forget that we have one in heaven who is bigger than our situation. He's more powerful than our failures. He will take our failures. He'll forgive them. He'll clean them. He'll move on. We, we begin to, to forget that Christ is there to fix and to make a future for us where we do not deserve a future. We forget that the new covenant is there specifically so that somebody else, Jesus, will have taken care and paid for that, for that, that failure or that place in your life so that you might have hope to move on. That's what Jesus is. When I say Jesus is my hope, it isn't be some, some cliché. It's because without him, there really isn't any hope. <laughs> Left to my own devices. Come on. Left to my own devices, there are no hope. There is, are no hope. That's cool. <laughs> there is no hope. Left to my own devices, there isn't. Because I'm a failure. Pastor Dale, don't talk like that. No, but it's really true. <laughs> but it doesn't matter how many times I fail. What matters is that Christ is the one 
that will get us and bring us and challenge us and build us up. You know, I'm reminded of Paul, who, who here Paul is, you know, persecuting the church and, and going out there and grabbing Christians and putting them in jail and trying to do everything he can do. And Jesus comes along and says, Paul, enough of that. Time for me to give you a new future. I want to change your failures and the direction you're going, and I want to change your, into a new future. This is who Jesus is in our life. This is who he wants to be, one who will change our past for the things, for a brand new present. That's why I have hope in him under this new covenant. Romans chapter 8. Turn me, Romans chapter 8. Verse 24. Romans 8, 24. Hope. Hope, then, is this idea that regardless of my position, regardless of my circumstances, regardless of my finances, Regardless of my failures, regardless of my weaknesses, regardless of all of the situations that are around me, Jesus has a plan to bring me out. There's hope there. Okay? So in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 24, the Bible says, We are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he hope for? But if, there, but if we hope, For that which we do not see, then we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So hope is the opposite of having. You with me? Why do you have hope? If you don't have hope, many people say, well, my things would just look up a little bit, I'd have hope. Things are looking up a little bit, you don't need hope. <laughs> if I just think, if I just get a you know a little better job, I'd have hope. Things would I'd see in my light. I'd see a light at the end of the tunnel. Listen, you get a better job. You don't need to see. You got you got the light at the end of there. You're there. You've got it. The better paychecks are coming in. Listen, if that's your issue, and all of a sudden money money is put into your bank, you don't now have hope. You don't need hope. You got the thing. Hope is the thing that we get. Through Christ, through this understanding that God is going to make a way before the answer comes. All right? This is what drove David to faith Goliath. It wasn't that he, it wasn't that he, Goliath was whipped. Now, everybody else, everybody else, they jumped up and went to battle like they had hope. They didn't have hope. Goliath was now dead. They were, they were in fear because there's a Goliath. In the church today, listen, I think sometimes we're waiting for somebody else to get hope, somebody else to get victory. If we, get, if, if, if we see victory, then I'll believe in Jesus. Hey, good luck. You have to believe and take that hope before the victory comes. Why do I have hope? Let me tell you why I have hope. I have hope because I have not yet shot my deer. <laughs> That's why I have hope. I'm hoping Because I haven't gotten him. Because once I get him, then I'm done. Then I don't have to worry about hope. Why do you have hope? I have hope because I'm kind of helpless. I have hope because I fail. Because I, I have issues. Because I'm not perfect. I have hope because I have not obtained. I have hope because I'm not yet there. I have hope because I've made mistakes in the past. I have hope because I need it. Because I need something bigger than me, stronger than me to take me on. If we were really honest with people today, and they say to us, well, what about Jesus? And we wouldn't start out our message with, why do we have hope with Jesus? We would not start out our message with, oh, Jesus is so great. That's not how it would go. If we truly understood the system, we'd start out with, well, the reason I have hope is because I'm kind of a mess. Matter of fact, I was a druggie, high school dropout, uh, kind of at the bottom of my rung. I had pretty much made a disaster of my life and all that by by 17. (laughs) I, uh, I, I, I have hope because I destroyed my life. I have hope because I have failed and failed and failed and failed and failed. And in the face of my failures and my failures and my failures and my failures and my failures, Jesus stepped in and he cleansed me and he forgave me. And he brought me victory over drugs. And he brought me freedom 
from the bondages of addiction. And he began to raise me up out of that. And he began to make, m make things happen and change in my life. And he began to do all these things. And I began to see God doing these things. You know, I, I have hope because God is the hope that brings me out. All right? That's where your hope comes in. I had hope that God would deliver me. Listen, if, if you have not been delivered, if you're stuck in addictions and you're stuck in there, your hope now, you need to begin to realize that God can bring you out from that. That begins to spark your hope and you move forward. Why do you not have hope? You don't have hope because you haven't quite figured out where hope, what, what it is that Jesus did and who Jesus is. He is our hope because he's our answer. We don't hope for what we see, but we hope for what we don't see. Hebrews chapter 6. But Pastor Dale, you're saying all these good things. And then, but, but you say that if I get it, I don't have hope. And if, but if I get it, then I'll get hope. I need hope. In chapter 6, verse 10. So, um, yeah. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That you n not be slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God promised to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless thee, and I will multiply thee, and multiplying I'll multiply thee. So after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men... Verily swell, swear by the greater, for an oath, for a confirmation to them, an end of all strife. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show his heirs, the heirs of promise, the immutable immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. An oath by two immutable things. First of all, it is impossible for God to lie. That we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us i remember my dad said to me one time he was reading this scripture and he said to me the bible says by two things and then it only lists one that <laughs> god can't lie and i thought huh i've been looking at that a while and then i realized something it did say two things one it said he swore an oath and number two he cannot lie here's the thing as men if we were to it, we sometimes, you know, we sign a contract, we put our name at a contract. I, when, I, when, I, when I bought a house, I signed about 30,000 contracts. Sign here, 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 sign here. I said, you will do this and this and this and this and this. And if you don't do this and this and this, we're going to do this and this. And if you don't do this, we're going to do this. And if you do this, we're going to. And we, boom, sign it up. There it is. Boom. There it is. There's my oath. I'm going to be held to that oath. We swear by, believe it or not, we swear by a court system or a government or we swear by, by the system that says, I'll do these things or you can go to the court systems to make me do what I promised I would do, right? Well, God can't go to any other court systems. There is no higher power. There is no bigger strength. There is nothing out there for God to do. That, that there's nothing he can swear by or put his name on the list that's higher than himself. And so the Bible says that God, looking at our life and looking at who we are, said, made an oath and promised this oath. And because God, people say nothing's impossible to God. That's not true. It is impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. And so we find here is God who cannot lie and he makes an oath. That means the promises of God, the Bible tells us that the promises of God are yes and amen for us. Meaning that it is a promise from God. Therefore, it is, a, it is an absolute, it is an absolute thing because God has said it. For years, there, or for, for a while, I remember uh, there was a bumper sticker that said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Right? And I thought, that's so cool. I told my dad, that's so cool. My dad said, I don't like it. I was confused. My dad was a very spiritual man. He loved God. He said, oh, I don't like it, son. It's just, it doesn't matter. I said, Dad, what are you talking about? He said, let me tell you something, boy. If God said it, that settles it, and it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. And I went, huh. 
That's true. <laughs> a lot of people don't believe it, but God said it, and it is still true. Doesn't matter whether they believe it or not, God said it, that makes it true. Here's the thing. Your hope of your life needs to be grounded in something that's immovable. An object that cannot be changed. It needs to be grounded in something that nothing in this world, nothing, there's no power, there's no demon, there's no force, there's no failure. There's nothing that can stop this thing from occurring in your life. And when you put your hope in the word of God, which is the voice of God, this is the promise, the oath that I have said unto you. This thing becomes the thing that we don't see, we haven't experienced. The Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for. What is that? That's where we look at God's word and we see what God said. And God said, I know the thoughts that I have for you. And the devil says to you, you're no good and you can't make it. And we take that hope and we say, wait, God says I can. So I can. Because God cannot lie. Why do I have hope? I have hope. Because God has promised some things. He's promised, he, he's promised me an eternal, he's promised eternal salvation for me. He's promised a heaven and, and a home and another place where there's no weeping and gnashing of teeth and no crying. He's promised me that place. That's the place that I'm, I, I'm promised and I'm going there because of that promise from him. He has promised me victory over the things. Freedom. He that's in Christ is set free. I, I've been working on a series on, on, on getting free. Th th you know, and, and thanks to Mike, he's got me all stirred up about it. And I've been looking at, at a series on getting free, and I'm thinking to myself, freedom. God has promised me freedom from bondages, from addiction, from depression. God has promised me to be free from these things. And what I need to do is begin to recognize God's promise as hope. I see a light at the end of the tunnel. I don't know how many times I've heard that. But I'm finally seeing a light. Because your situation has changed. Before your situations change, get into the word and see a light. Because God's word is the light. God's promise is the way. God has made an oath. Therefore, there's a way out. Romans chapter 14, 15. Romans chapter 15. Amen. You guys with me? You all right? Okay. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Why do I have hope? Because despite all of the failures of my life, Christ has accepted me. He has forgiven me. He has a plan. He'll work it out. For, it's, for whatsoever things were written aforetimes were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. That we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Hope. Now I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna read here. The Bible tells us here that the things that we read in this scripture were written so that we, with patience and comfort from these things, would have hope. How do I get hope? Listen, when the when the, when the electric company comes knocking at your door, when the when the when when you have failed, when you have got to this place where you don't know what to do, maybe you look at your life and you realize how much sin you have committed and you don't see any way out for you. I want to remind you of men in the Bible, Paul, who was out there killing Christians. Did you kill any Christians lately? <laughs> There's hope for you. <laughs> I want to remind you of the people who, 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 there was no hope, who stood there facing enemies bigger than them, and God brought them hope. There's hope for you. With comfort and scripture, two things, and I'm going to wrap this up, but i got to throw this in there because it's part of the series of the nine principles of Christian maturity. And, and this is the, through patience. You guys know what patience is, right? I preach a whole message on it if you don't get the DVD. The Bible says that patience, everybody is confused by patience. I, I'm telling you, people don't understand patience. The Bible says, let patience have its perfect work in you, that you may be perfect, wanting nothing. And we think somehow if I wait in a line nice, then I'm going to have patience. I don't think so. That's not going to make you perfect. <laughs> patience is huge. What the Bible is saying here, patience is hopefully enduring hardship. The Bible is telling us here, if you struggle through, fight through, endure what you're going through, and put this scripture in, and you look at where you're at, and you look at the things of God, and you fight through it. When you fight through it, and you stand, not going back, not pulling back, you take the comfort of the scripture... And you put hope. This is faith. This is what David did. When David looked out there and he saw Goliath. And he remembered what God had said. And he, and he went in and he said, I'll do it. He began to push himself out there. 
He hadn't seen God's victory yet because Goliath wasn't beaten. But he said, I'm going to go out there and face Goliath. I'm going to push myself out in there because God's going to make a way for me. In your life, listen, the, the devil may have told you you can't, may have beaten you down, may have done all of those things. You need to grab hold of God's word by, by, by this thing. God has made these promises in my life. If you don't have a promise, get to it. If you're struggling in your life, open your Bible. You know how many times I have been in a place in my life when I needed something from God and I whip my Bible open and, and something would just jump out and touch my spirit and I'd go, oh, okay. And I put it down and part of me going, yeah, whatever, God. You know, <laughs> and then part of me go, no, God's word, God's word, God's word, God's word, God's word. I got to take that. I got to take it. I got to take it. That's the thing. And then you get yourself, you stir yourself up. That Bible says that, that David would, would judge himself in the Lord. Gosh, can you imagine what that looked like? <laughs> Here's David. Everybody wanted to kill him, and the Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. Listen, wherever you're at, whatever's going on, if you feel hopeless, get a hold of God's word and encourage yourself in God's word. Don't, 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 don't start calling everybody you know to tell them how bad things are. You know, you call five, 15 people and make somebody feel sorry for me. My pastor, my old pastor, listen, nobody would call Pastor Clayton when they would go through things because he, he, they would call his wife. Because he would look at you. He didn't feel sorry for you. Oh, come here. I'm so sorry. He, he would not do that. He would look at you and say, really? That's not what the word says. Boom. Just get up. You look at him like, well, that wasn't very nice. You know? Get up. I remember how I was going through this, this, this one time. I was going through this incredible, just, I don't know what was going on. I'm sitting there. We are at after church and i'm running along and i'm sorry we're sitting there after church you know and we're all sitting around at this like restaurant we're eating and i'm sitting there with my wife the pastor's wife was sitting over there he said you better go talk to them and i'm like i'm not going to talk to him you need to go talk to pastor i'm not going to go talk to pastor and i'm sitting there and she says to me she says because my wife loves me she says if you don't go talk to him i'm going to she's a good woman i said okay i don't want her to do it <laughs> Right? I said, okay. And I remember I go over there and I sit down beside him and I'm getting ready because I know he's just going to cowabunga me. And I start in, you know, Pastor, this, 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 this. And he looks at me and he goes, the Bible says, come ye apart and rest for a while or just come ye apart, whichever you want. Jesus told the disciples, come ye apart and rest for a while. And he said, the Bible says, come ye apart and rest for a while or just, you can just come ye apart, whichever you want. Go take a break. And I went, Hey, <laughs> I like this guy. The word of God brings the answers that you need in every situation in your life. All right, so Romans chapter 15. And I forgot to write it down. I think it was 13. Now the God of hope. Yes, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of of the Holy Ghost. Two things I want to share with you. One, where do we get hope? We get hope because of God's word. You take God's word and you put it in there. And then the Bible says that through the power of the Holy Ghost, the presence of God begins. I can't explain this to you. Where did your hope come from? It came from two things. One, it came from God's word, and then it began to come from the power of the Holy Spirit who began to move into my heart, who began to encourage me, who began to lift me up. And somewhere from a place that I didn't know how or where or explain or I can't, the, this, the presence of God begins to come in and encourage me and lift me up and begin to build my hope in two different areas. How do I get hope when I'm hopeless? Listen, I'm going to say this cliche, Jesus. But to, it's not just as simple as just stand up and going, okay, Jesus, get me. You're going to have to, you might have to stick it out a little while. Come on, that's always good for somebody in a, in a rough place. You might have to stick it out a little while. But you need to get that word in your life. You need to get a promise. You need to get something in that scripture that you can stand on. And then weak need and barely standing, you'll take it and you go, okay, God, I'm taking it, but nothing's really changing. And then the Holy Spirit will begin to quicken it. The Bible says that he'll quicken your mortal body and he'll, he'll begin to quicken your mind. He'll begin to power, he'll begin to cause that word to begin to come alive in you. It'll begin to do something in you. It'll begin to stir your spirit. It'll begin to stir your mind. It'll begin to shake you up a little bit. And all of a sudden, you'll be up there going, hey, no problem. I got this. And everybody will be looking at you going, why in the world are you hopeful? Nothing has changed. 
Nothing in your life has changed. No situations changed. Nothing has happened. Nothing seems to be different. But now, your attitude is all different about it, and you're looking at your problem in a different light. I see David, you know, over here. He's over there realizing that his people wanted to kill him. You know, I love his story. At Ziglag, you know, and he's over there. He's all of his, and the Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. What happened? He went over there, and he said, God, you said. God, you said. God, you said. This is your word. You said you would do this. You're the king. You're the God. You're the one that I trust. And, 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 and the Holy Spirit would get a hold of him. And when he came back out of the tent to his people, he came back out there and he said, hey, come on. Let's go get our stuff back. And everybody's like, oh, look at David. That's different from the David that went in the tent that we want to kill. This is a David who with, with power and with authority is now saying, come on, let's move on to get what God has promised us. Listen, the devil does not want you to have hope. Hope is the thing that will keep you alive. Hope is the thing that will bring you out. Hope is the thing that will cause you to be victorious in your life when you will not be before. They, there's this experiment. I'm going to wrap this up, but an experiment that they did, and this is kind of graphic and probably get, probably get emails on this one. They took these mice, and they put them in water, and they covered it up and didn't let any light in. And after a few hours, the mice gave up and drowned. And they took mice, and they put them in a container, the same container that they could not get out of, but they left the top off so light could get in. And they went for hour after hour. Why? Because of hope. Without hope, the devil is stealing from you your victory. The devil is taking from you your freedom. The devil is taking from you your, your, your deliverance. The devil is taking from you your way out. Because you look at your situation hopelessly, and because of your hopelessness, you just stay right where you're at. And if you get yourself to recognize God's word, if nothing else, maybe this morning you're going, oh, Pastor Dale, I don't like it. I can believe it. That's good enough for me. Let the Holy Spirit begin to do his work in you and bring hope in your life. And listen to me what will happen. You'll find yourself climbing out. You'll find yourself free. You'll find yourself getting victory over depression. You know what? Depression is there because you feel like you're never going to get out. Come on. You get hope. All of a sudden you don't have depression because you have hope. Because you're here and you're stuck and you don't see a way out. God's word and is, is the way out. Hope for the hopeless comes. Listen, you may have failed a thousand times. God will still take you. It may be your fault. There's only one, one priest out there who can say, I'm in a better mood. You're not guilty. Jesus says, I already paid for it, so boom, not guilty. There's only one out there who can say, not guilty. Let's try this again. You're not guilty by reason of Jesus Christ and his blood that was shed for you. You have victory by reason of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That like as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, so you also shall walk in newness of life. I'm free, not because of who I am, but because Jesus brings power. That you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That I have, I'm free, not because of any of these other things, but by Jesus' power and his authority and his resurrection and his crucifixion. I have hope because there is hope for me through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. Because regardless of our situations or our failures or our inadequacies or, or our weaknesses, despite of all of those things, Hope comes because of who you are, Jesus, and by nothing else. By your word and by who you are, God, this is where hope comes. And God, I thank you. And Lord, I pray right now for those who are sitting in this room and in this place or, 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 or maybe on, on YouTube or on the Internet or wherever they might be. God, I pray for them right now that they'll recognize their hope doesn't come from their circumstances. Their hope doesn't come from their situation, but their hope comes from God's word and Jesus Christ, who in the beginning was the word. We thank you in Jesus' name.